This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Thanks for joining me. I'm honored to bring you a chat with Demonaz from Immortal. Now, the catalyst for our conversation is the launch of the album Northern Chaos Gods in 2018. We delve into his thoughts on the album, and he also shares his recollections of the band's 2007 shows in Australia, and of course, the significant event of the split within Immortal involving Abbott. Now, it's worth noting that based on recent online commentary, Demon Az may have provided more detailed insights on the reasons behind the split in this chat compared to these new interviews leading up that are all occurring because of the release of War Against All, in uh, I think it's in April or May of 2023 so just keep that in mind as you're listening to this one here so I appreciate it's a few years old already but the topic's still very relevant Mm -hmm. so here he is Demonaz from Immortal Uh, John gave to me ran out of gas so I've just called back on my Skype account all good we can continue all good (laughs) all right Uh, I'm ready when you are no worries mate all right look I'll kick things off now I'm going to start by saying I am an old fan, probably as old a fan as you could possibly get for somebody in Australia. Um, my first recollections of extreme metal are actually intertwined with Immortal, meaning that the first album that I ever picked up that I'd classify as an extreme metal release was Pure Holocaust. So that's how far back mm. I go. That was about 1993 or thereabouts when I was 15 or so. And the cover scared the shit out of me. It was one of those albums where um, you, you, you looked at the cover and you knew what you were going to get, but the music inside <laughs> was one of those things that was like, what is this? this? This looks like something from outer space. It doesn't even look satanic. It looks beyond that. It looks like it's something from outer space. But So I'm going to kick off by saying thank you for making the music that you've made because it's been an integral part of my life for a long time. And uh, to that end, when I was a young fella, and you might laugh at this, but um, when, I, when I used to get ready to go into the city at night on the weekends, my, my, get, my getting together song, if you like, or the song that used to get me psyched up to go out and, to be completely frank with you, try to pick up women and have a bit of a good time was Storming Through Clouds and Holocaust Winds. So, <laughs> wow. I don't know whether you've ever been given that feedback before. But I loved it. I got right into it back then. I, I, really, I really hope you you, 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 you you get to pick up some of them. <laughs> it, it, I did a few times. I got to tell you. I mean, God, when you, when you're sort of eighteen and nineteen, it's not easy. Let me tell you. When you go into the city and you're going to, I, I wasn't. I wasn't even going to metal clubs. I was going to dance clubs and the like. And um, you're trying to talk to women, but. I love the track. And, Isn't that and, where all the great uh, girls are? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all the good girls? <laughs> well, well there, are, there are a few clubs where, put it this way, there are a few clubs where you had an easier time in them than in some of the other clubs, put it that way. There wasn't as much competition, if you like, and I had that sort of sussed out by that stage. But, uh, look, I'm happily married these days. But, yeah, um, look, it's a bit of an oh, introduction, dude. but, yeah. I think if you do the same thing today... Try to pick up some girl with uh, listening to that song first. I'm not sure if it would be the same. <laughs> not at not at not at 40 years of age. God, these days um, <laughs> I've been married for almost 10 years. I've got two daughters. As I think I was saying before the bloody call dropped out, and um, yeah, but I still enjoy your music, mate. And that's I guess that's what my first question for you is: you've got to be happy. Did you did you hear the whole album? I did, and I've reviewed it already. Yeah, and I like it. By the way, okay, so that, that's good for me to know when we talk. Because some sometimes when when people call, they they, they only heard the first song, and then it's so much different. To talk, oh, really? I yeah, to to yeah, I can imagine. To me, mm. the brand new album, Northern Chaos Gods, it sounds as if it's a natural successor to Blizzard Beasts. Is that right? I actually talked to to Metal Hammer Greece. Uh, before you go, and, and the guy said the same. He, he asked uh-huh. me where I would put this album uh, if I could go back. I, I, I told him I would put it between At the Heart of Winter and, and Blizzard Beast, maybe, in a way. Because because uh, I wanted the, uh, this album to have the energy. It, it was It was like... Uh, I guess you're going to ask me about what happened to the band and 
in 2014-15, but, but we can take, talk about that later. Uh, yeah, I think it was time to, to to just concentrate on the music. It was really delicious to do that after all the things that happened to us, and I I really wanted to uh, go back to to the time when 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 we had the real energy and and where, where there was more freedom, you know, to to yeah. uh, to think about the band only and nothing else, and and, and just look out the world. And say that we're gonna to put together an album. I don't care about anybody outside. So it made the album more vital, more furious, more like pushing things to the limit because I felt that freedom when I was, this time it was only me writing all the riffs, you know, and, and came up with ideas for the song. So I, I felt uh, an enormous freedom just to to do whatever was necessary to make, uh, yeah. A great album, and don't think about anybody else so much. Yeah. The other thing that I really noticed on this album, and this is not a slight on Abbott in the slightest, but you're clearly a better guitarist. Now, what I mean by that is I'm a musician as well, so I listen intently to the guitarist or a bass player's performance, and uh, or any musician's performance, including a drummer, of course. Um, your your picking technique is superior to his, and that was probably the first thing that I noticed about the album. Even before us, before I made the connection that it was probably a successor to Blizzard Beast. So, have you been given a lot of feedback that the album sounds different because of your guitar playing as well? Well, you know, I was the main guitarist when I. St- if we go back, we could say like uh, from the beginning. I came from this band called Amputation, which was my band. Uh, I wrote all the songs there, and, and, and it was a death trash band, death metal band. And, and, and when I was doing this, I was thinking, well, it gets a bit monotone because I haven't didn't have the experience for many years of writing at that time. You know, it was I was very young, and. and then I, I wanted to make a new band. I wanted to make the ultimate band. I had the name Immortal and a wish. And, and then I met Abad. I saw Old Funeral. There was a local band. They were playing yeah. at Vafta in, in, in Bergen. And I heard the voice of Abad. I, I was thinking, and I knew him a bit. I, I met him and I knew he was into the same kind of music that I was. And I met him and I asked him if he wanted to join me. I, I, I told him about my plans that I... I, I don't want to play in the weekends. I want to make a proper band and give a shit in the rest of the ball and just do this forever. And he, he he wanted to join me, but he had to finish up his concerts with Old Funeral. It was three or four concerts, I think, one in Finland and something, and then he would join me. Okay. So I had an idea to find this drummer, which was uh, Amageda from, from uh, a guy that I really went to class with, uh, school from younger years and, yeah. and we knocked at his door and asked if he wanted to play with us and that's how Immortal uh, came to in the beginning and, and we did some demos it was death metal influence but my interest was really in Bathory, Venom and Celtic Frost and Hellhammer and those kind of music So and, and the same with Abbott so we changed afterwards but my guitar playing which was the question started with Tony Iommi and, and that was very slow right the Black Sabbath things but when I came into trash metal and I listened to Metallica, uh, the, the riffing on, on the first Metallica album was really fascinating me, you know? It was fast, it was furious, it was something new. They were breaking some limit. And after that, it was like no return. In a way, it was like I wanted to do, and the same with Slayer, you know? Slayer also had that fast picking. And, and it became something that I, I really rehearsed on and worked on. I always remember Albert said to me, well, Fuck! Nobody can pick as fast as you can. I don't. I, 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 and it's not to brag about anything, but it's like that was how, how I, hmm. in a way, started to play it. I just wanted to play fast and make this uh, special kind of playing. And on the four first Immortal albums, I about played the bass. You know, he was not a guitarist, but he was he was with me also in the songs, composing and making riffs, and he he had a lot of brilliant ideas, you know, he's a very talented musician, but we are different in a way, he he came from something else when it comes to the instrument, you know, while I was three years older than him, and I also, I also helped him a lot with the guitar playing, of course, you know, because 
he was young when I met him, and he was not experienced. And I was three years at that time of, of 20 years. When you're 20 years, it's a lot of years, you know? Got you, absolutely. <laughs> different. Yeah. So, so, so I was always like, I wanted the music to be faster. You know? I wanted was to make, when we made Pure Holocaust, I wanted the album to be faster than Diabolical Form of Mysticism. When we made Battles in the North, I wanted to break the speed limit on that one too. And when we did Bristol Beast, I ripped my arms off. <laughs> yeah, I can hear that. <laughs> I can definitely hear that, yeah. So what was... So, uh, oh, sorry, you go. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say the 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 jump from yeah. the jump from uh, diabolical full moon mysticism into pure holocaust is actually bigger than the jump that Metallica made from Kill 'Em All into Ride the Lightning. So I love both albums, by the way. As you can, as I've already explained, I'm an old fan. I think Unholy Forces of Evil is one of the greatest tracks ever written by any band ever in any genre. Believe me, I really do. It's an it's a song that when I was younger, I was playing in. You'll laugh at this. I was playing in bands that sounded more like Primus, you know, like that. I wouldn't call it funk, but I play a lot. Oh, of slap. I think Primus was cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I play a lot of slap bass, right? But I was trying to convince the guys in the band, and the drummer was with me, with me to actually cover "Unholy Forces of Evil" in our own style. Um, I loved it that much, but the jump was was significant, wasn't it? So, what was the inspiration behind? Uh, I know you're talking about playing faster and the like, but. That diabolical full moon mysticism has its own sound, and of course, pure Holocaust takes it to a whole new level. I actually don't think pure Holocaust has been bested for speed, in that it's just such a fast album. You're recording it about the drummer that you had at the time. Well, that was you playing drums, I think, wasn't it on the album? Am I correct in saying no, that? No, it was about playing the drums. Actually. Well, look, mm. it's it's so incredibly fast that even in 2018. It doesn't sound dated, and that's a hell of an accomplishment for an album that came out in 1992 or 1993. But what made you, uh, what what inspired the leap to, to go as fast as you possibly could? Was it just, were you, were you trying to just show everybody in the world that you guys were the fastest and the best black metal band around? I think it was a combination of my love for Morbid Angel demo, Thy Kingdom Come, you know, and 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 also also the Bathory albums uh, like Massacre, this song, you know, from under the sign of the Black Mark, you know. It was like we wanted to play fast and be violent in a way, and 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 the title Pure Holocaust, it really came from the song Holocaust with Bathory uh-huh. from from the One Five Death album. Okay, yep. And, and, and I remember those songs were like. They weren't as fast as the song. Uh, they weren't like blast beats. They were fast, but they were really intense. And the three first, uh, um, not the three first songs, but those three fast songs, like Dice Area, uh, uh, Holocaust, and, and uh, uh, those songs were like, there was something really violent about them. And, uh, and I was trying to pick really fast. I was trying to make riffs really fast. And... At the same time, put them into the uh, that atmosphere, you know. So I, I really think we, we learn also. Also, we learned on the way. We were part of a subculture. We didn't even know about it. I think we were like just young and wanted to prove something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, that answers that question. There you go. And do you, do you, out of out of all of your classic albums, the two in particular, so Pure Holocaust and Blizzards, uh, uh, Battles in the North. Sorry. Which one of those mm-hmm. two do you get the most feedback from about fans and, and the media? I don't know, because uh, I think those two albums define the band in a way, uh, because Diabolical Full of Misses was a more like different record. It was the debut album, and when you do a debut album, it's always like uh, difficult. When you follow up, you have to you have to do something better than the one before, and I, I just think that we wanted to be faster, we wanted to be more furious. But the question was about who's asking me about those two albums. I think in many ways, Pure Holocaust is a classic to a lot of hardcore black metal fans. While Battles in the North is an album that proved that we will stay there in a way we we wouldn't. Even if the cover was white and it was spectacular or different and uh, and, and the, the black and white stuff, it, it was like a statement that this band is not going to wimp out 
at least not on the next album. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's so definitely the, the case. Are, <laughs> both, of, both those albums, I, I think, are classics to people in a way. Okay, yeah. So what inspired you to... I, I know you, you haven't necessarily come back because you've always been a part of the Immortal Fold, but look, I, uh, being an old fan, I remember reading through the uh, fanzines and the like back in the day in the 90s and the, the very few e- interviews that I could find on the internet that you had an injury, of course, you had tendonitis and you had to take some time out from, from playing playing that fast guitar. I know you didn't give up the guitar completely, as a lot of people misunderstand. But what has inspired yeah, you? Yeah, it's a big misunderstanding, really, because um, what happened was that after this abuse, yeah. I got problems yeah. with my arm. It was the left arm that was the problem. Uh, and, and I got, like, uh, numb in the arm from playing. It, it means that I had to slow down on the playing. There was not, not, not a problem with the technical ability. There was not a problem with, with uh, that, I could, that I had to stop playing, but yeah. I, I just couldn't rehearse that much. You know, like we were used to going to the rehearsal room every day, play for two hours, and then maybe you will play guitar when you come home or whatever. But, but it, it became like I got tired in the arm when I was playing after half an hour. You know, it was right. like... I couldn't do it uh, for 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 that long time. So, what happened was that when we came to the point with At the Heart of Winter, we wrote the album, but I, I couldn't record it because uh, some sometimes there was uh, days I couldn't play. I just had to say, well, today I can't play it because the arm is like fuck, fucked up because of yesterday, you know. Yeah. yeah. But what, what we did in, instead of rec- uh, finding a new guitar player because me and Abad understood that if I would quit the band the band would be over okay and it's yeah. very easy because I wrote all the lyrics I wrote the majority of the music and and that is why we continue this way so it became a, a bit uh, frustrating for us in this period but after At the Heart of Winter that is why we had session basis you know so that the core of the band could be me, Abbott, and Horn. Hmm. Because it was us three that was the driver of the band. We were uh, working with the band. It was we. It was the three of us that we were in the rehearsal room, worked with the songs, and the other guys never came into the band, like Iscaria or, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, the other guys that came in after. The other guys that never or... been, like, uh, they never became full, full members, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when we were down the black, I lost a bit of the spirit because I felt like there was something with me and Abbott also. We didn't have the same passion and he was experimenting with, I don't know if I should tell everything, but it's like, so we lost it a bit on down the black and I think you can hear that. The, the, this, that album wasn't as vital as the other ones. I thought it came then, out. Sorry, you go. And then, yeah, and then, and then we we were like, when we go going to record Sons of the Darkness, we we shaped up. We I remember we were talking and fuck man, we, we can't let this band go to hell. We have to work on this album. And me and Abbott got closer again, you know. And we were working with this album very close. But after Sons of the Darkness, it took toll on us, you know. It was like he had his problems. And and I was also a bit like, I, I saw that maybe we can't say this, so we we decided to take a break. Yeah, yeah. But but I never gave up on Immortal. I but wanted to do this I project. It means like I found the name for that and I wrote the lyrics for that and I, I backed them up, you know. But it was like the, my intention was that I did it because I thought that if we do an album together now, maybe we can do. Immortal again. Maybe I could convince him, or maybe we could get back on that passion way and, and find a solution for Immortal. And we did that. We came back in 2007. We made All So Fall, but it didn't become the same. You know, we, the passion was lost in a way hmm. because of the, some disagreements between us and because uh, he had his personal issues, whatever it is. <laughs> I, yeah. I really don't want to go into. Not too much because he's not here when I'm talking, and there's no bad blood between us. You know, no, I understand. Really, yeah, no, I understand. I'm not bitter. There's not a problem with that. But but we didn't function as a band the way I wanted it. I thought we lost something on the way. The spirit wasn't there 100, percent and I need that. 
So when the conflict came after Also Fall and after we wrote that next album, which he took with him and created as his own solo album with some changes, whatever, it was clear that we had to separate. And when that happened, to me, there was a relief in a way because the problems had been going on for so many years and I felt the freedom to take back the band and vitalize it, you know, go back and find, I wanted to find the energy that was there, like we were talking about in, in 93, 94, 95, you know, uh, and, and I locked the wall out. I told Hogue to, or we were talking about it. Let, let's, let's just forget about everything now. Anyone, and let's do the next Immortal album. And, uh, and, and when the album is ready, we can talk to people again. <laughs> it's easy as that, no? Yeah. Okay. God, that's that's a very comprehensive summary of about the last fifteen years you've just given me there. Um, and it's I told uh, <laughs> No, you've done really well because it it I don't I don't feel like I need to ask any questions about Abbott because you've what you've done is you, as I say you've given me a very good summary of what what the last fifteen years fifteen years has held. What's interesting though that you said there was that. There was an album written that Abbott took with him. So, is that the music that ended up on his Abbott on, on the on the actual album that he released? Is it which was destined to be an immortal album? We made nearly all the songs and pre-productions for all those songs. And when the conflict ended, before that, he left, and he took with him. Uh, he made a lot of those, those riffs. Hmm. And and some of those songs were his major uh, parts, you know. So so uh, that's all right. But, but we worked on this together with the structure and everything. Yeah, the arrangements and, were done and, by you. And, yeah. And when he le- decided to leave the band, suddenly he found some members without uh, telling us, and and because we were in the middle of this disagreement, for back and forth, and then he said goodbye in a way with just. Uh, taking those songs and leaving us, you know. He didn't take my lyrics. Uh, I think there was a lot of respect in some way, but uh, whatever. So, so we started, I had to start from scratch, from scratch in May 2015 after we left, and, and, and I wrote North and Chaos Gods as the first song. Yeah. Okay. It was the first song I wrote, I wrote uh, uh, just after, uh, yeah. Okay, all right. Look, I'll take a bit of a 90-degree turn and I'll ask you about your relationship with Australia because, uh, as I've pointed out a few times, I'm a whole fan and I'm not the only one. There's quite a lot of us down here that do like the band and I'm sure I'm correct in saying the only time Immortal ever toured was in 2007 or 2008 and it was, then it was only, I think you only played Sydney and Melbourne or Sydney or Melbourne. It was a very short tour that you did. It was. Well, a- we, we did uh, uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, Brisbane... Um, one more city, I think. Did you play Brisbane? Did you? I mean, I, I, yeah, that's where I'm from. So I, I didn't. I, I was really disappointed that I couldn't go and see you. But I think it was because I thought you were only playing in Sydney or Melbourne. There you go. My bad. <laughs> yeah, and, and and we also played uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, Auckland, and and. and um, What's the last city called? Um, uh, Auckland. I don't remember. Auckland or Wellington, it probably would have been. Auckland and Wellington. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So, what's the what? Have you got a lot of mail over the years from Australia? Because I was reading in a very old interview with you last night that was posted in about 1997, and this was you were interviewed prior to the release of Blizzard Beasts, and you were talking about doing a tour, and that included Australia. So we must have been on your radar very early on as a place that you wanted to either visit and or you had fans down here. I always wanted to go there. I always wanted to go to New Zealand also especially because I heard so much about it. And, and uh, when, But we never had the opportunity to go before that in 2007. Uh, so, so it was like uh, when we finally got there, we really had, uh, had a great time there, really. I thought it was fantastic to be there. I thought it was like uh, people there were totally different. <laughs> it was like uh, very nice, actually, really nice. And and the fans from there were really into it. And in Sydney, they were like 
I think it was like 800 people on the concert or 900, I'm not sure, but it was like really intense and, and great and the people were really enthusiastic about it. We had a really good time, so I really want to come back, you know? Mm, yeah, cool, cool. Well, I, I'm going to plant this as a seed that I hope that I hope grows because I, I know that Peter Tagtron, of course, produced the album and I had a chat to him a couple of weeks back because he's coming down with his um, industrial vehicle pain. But what I'd love to see is a two-pronged attack, so immortal and hypocrisy. What do you reckon? Do you reckon you could bring that show down to Australia? Well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, look, it's, I know... Could be, could be killer. Yeah, look, I know Dicey from... Glenn Dyson, sorry. He's, um, he's a chap who uh, runs or owns... I think it's... Um, it's not is it Destroy All Lines? One of one of the agencies, one of the touring companies over here, anyway. So I might send him a bit of a message to hit both yourself and and Peter up to try to bring you guys down as a bit of a uh, as a package, actually, because that'd be a hell of a show. Prior to uh, Martin Eric Ain passing away, I actually thought that Celtic Frost and Immortal would be the perfect package, but that obviously can't happen. So hypocrisy, not that they're the next best thing. Hypocrisy are also an excellent band, and Peter's a wonderful bloke. Uh, that'd be a heck of a tour, but it does. It actually does allow me to lead into my next question, so I'll make that a point, and I'll ask you this next question. How did you go working with Peter? Because I know he's worked with some of the best in the biz in heavy metal. Um, was it just a natural choice to work with him for the new album? Well, the first time we worked with him was in, at, the, on, at the Hot of Winter. Uh, and, and he produced uh, all the albums after, you know, more or less. And, and, and it's like this time we wanted to go with him as well. And we were talking with him very early about it. And, and after we did the, I, I go back to 2015. We started to write the album, and I start with Nothing Else Gone. So then we were finished with all the songs one year after, late 2016. The pre-production was finished. We sent it to Peter. We already talked to him before. And when he heard it, we were talking about the sound, how I wanted it and how Hog wanted the drums and everything. And I realized this is the way to go because he understands it. He's a brilliant musician and also a great producer. So what happened was that we entered the studio in 2017, just a few months after all the songs were finished in January. And the drums were recorded in one week. And, and then I started to do the guitars. And I did the guitars in Bergen, not in Abyss. I recorded it here in, 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 our, in my city. And, and when I sent down the guitar tracks, uh, Peter offered to do the bass. He, he told Horg uh, first that uh, the songs are great. I can do the bass if you want. Maybe that would be good for you. And I thought it was a good idea because I made all the riffs and I thought on the pre-productions, it was like I was playing more or less, I'm not a bassist, so I was playing more like with the guitars, if you understand what I mean. But he was objective, you know, so he could do the bass in a different way. And he sent us some tracks with the bass on and I was uh, I was instantly hooked. And also for the production, it was like just what, we, what I wanted, you know. It was like, wow, this sounds like the guitars were lo-fi, the drums were really dark sounded with not too much sustain, you know, so I thought it was like, it immediately brought me uh, in the into the right atmosphere and, and the vision that I, I had, you know, for the songs. Yeah. Heavy, fast, grim and dark, and even like, uh, you could think back to those albums in 94, 95, 96, uh, without uh, the song, it sounded like it was recorded in the garage, you know. So, so I really loved it, and I loved the way he was playing the bass, and then the motor had his sound. He, he made it to that, yeah. so some kind of distortion. And it was really powerful. So, so it was a no-brainer. From there, from there, I just I just do the bass on every song. It was fantastic. Cool, mate. I think that's my time up. Half an hour. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, as I say, it's it's gosh, it's it's really thrilling for me to do what it is that I do these days because I'm able to talk to musicians and artists whose music I've followed for 25 years. I've been following you guys, and you're a good bloke, mate. I really want to thank you for answering all of my questions and for giving so much detail as what you've done. Um, 
you know, it, it, it never fails to amaze me that a lot of the bands that I really like and I've admired growing up, they end up being really nice people when I talk to them over the phone. And I'm here in Australia, you're in Norway, so we're bloody all the way across the world from each other. But I just want to thank you for the chat and thank you so much for making the music that you make and I really hope to see you down here in Australia sometime in the near future. Yeah, it's really good to talk to you and uh, good talk and good questions. I usually... If the questions are great, you know, I normally talk a lot. If not, I just say yes or no. <laughs> so <laughs> this was uh, definitely a good one. No, thank you very much, mate. I really appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, congratulations again. Yeah. Thank you, and have a great Saturday. No worries, mate. Thank you very much again. Cheers. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I enjoyed participating in it. So if you liked that one, there are many more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading, because I've written a book about the podcast, click on the link in the banner on the website. You'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice and you can download a sample. And if you do complete the purchase, I want to thank you personally. So please do hit me up. I've got some more information to share with you about the book in the moment. But before we get to that, I need to bid you a fond farewell. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it is a very good bye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, Playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, I, just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldina. Chuck was always, um, you know, he, he was, very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled 
to read the whole book. <laughs>